Okay, so let's get started on the next section where we're going to use cross-validation to generate the data on which we uh, will apply our different calibration methods. So we talked about this before, I'll just repeat again. So what we're going to do this time is rather than having an independent calibration set, which is uh, undesirable because whatever data used for calibration is data you cannot use to train your model, and so you have a tension there of how much how much to leave for each part of the, the model fitting. Um, so if you use cross-validation, you can kind of get the best of both worlds. You can take that whole data set, use all of it to train your model, and use all of it to calibrate your model, which, which sounds great. Um, the downside is twofold. Uh, one, it takes more time because you not only have to now train the model on the full training set, you also have to train it on these uh, five different uh, collections of four folds. So I'm assuming five-fold cross-validation. So we're going to train the model on the whole thing. That's going to be your model going forward. And then we're also going to train it, leaving out each one of the five-folds. So we're going to train it five more times. And every time we train one of those five new models, we're going to use it to predict on the left out fold. And we're going to keep track of all those scores. So then at the end of this process, we'll have a score for every data point and they come from one of five different models. And if this is done properly, one thing you have to be careful of that there's no leakage across the folds. If you have sort of the same data point in two different folds, that could cause a problem. But assuming that doesn't happen, this will usually serve well as an appropriate debt calibration set. Now, it's a little, it's a little strange because the data using to calibrate on came from one of five different models, and each of those models is slightly different than the model you're actually going to apply this calibration to. But we're sort of assuming that those discrepancies are going to be minor and that it will work out. And what we see in practice is that usually that is the case. So how are we going to do this? Well, in the ML Insights, we have a nice function which will get these cross-validated predictions for you pretty simply. You give it the model, you give it your X train and your Y train. This clone model, uh, if you're using a scikit-learn that can be cloned by the clone function, then you could set this to true. If not, you should set this to false. If you set it to false, it's going to overwrite your model. So you should make sure you don't care about the model that you pass to the function because it will uh, it will change it. So let's run this. This is going to take a little bit of time to run because now it's got to do five trains. So by default, this does five-fold cross-validation. That's one of the parameters you can change that I, I left as the default. And then once this finishes, we're going to take this new data set, CV Preds train one and Y train one, and that's going to be our calibration data. So let's go through plat scaling now with this bigger data set. And let's look at this graph. So one thing we see with, this is our new calibration data. We see we have a lot more data, right? So before when our calibration data was small, the, the dots jumped around a lot. And now we see kind of a much clearer picture. And the other thing we see is compared to the previous calibration data, we have a lot more data points above this line over here. And that's why this time around, the plat scaling came up a little bit higher. Um, now, some of that's just luck of the draw, right? Uh, the calibration sets, remember there's not a lot of data up here when we're looking at these dots. This is a very small fraction of the overall data. So we would expect that to jump around from set to set. Um, but the upshot here is that the plat scaling didn't change much. The main way it changed is it just decided to move up a little bit. It's only got two degrees of freedom. So it kind of used one of them to move up a little bit. And here's how it fits the data. I don't know that you can visually make a judgment as to which one fits the test data better. Um, here's the reliability diagram after the scaling. And the upshot is things didn't really change much. We get almost the same log loss with the bigger data set as before. Now let's look at isotonic regression. Here we should expect a bigger difference because isotonic needs a lot of data. 
and you see that in fact um, you know now the curve fits the calibration data quite well we still see it's doing this sort of staircase kind of pattern and that's typical of isotonic regression as you get more and more data those steps will become very very small so it'll start looking like a very smooth curve um, and this is the by comparison the previous curve remember the previous curve is fit on a, a different data set so not only smaller but also different um, and so let's see now when we go to the test data um, you know, it's doing pretty well. Now, remember, there's always some luck of the draw in terms of however you choose your calibration set. There might be some luck of the draw in that it might really look, look just like your test set or it might end up looking a lot different. And some of that's just a uh, natural variance. Um, but here, here's how it fits the test data. And uh, here's the reliability diagram after the calibration. And at the using the logit scaling, and then finally we see that it did improve uh, quite a bit before it was worse than uncalibrated. Now it's doing better. It's doing almost as well as plot scaling. Again, there's some luck of the draw. I would say most of the time with this much data, isotonic would outperform plot scaling, but in in this case it did not. Okay. Um, Let's look at beta calibration. So here we see beta calibration actually changed quite a bit. Again, we notice this difference of the in, in the old calibration set versus the new calibration set. The new calibration set has a lot more data above the line on these larger values, even though there might not be a, a huge number of data points there. Um, so it, it changed a bit more than, for example, plat scaling did. And here's how it fits the test data. It's hard to say whether it's really better or worse, even just visually. And uh, here's the reliability diagrams. And we see it does seem to do a little better. Now it's doing better than plat scaling. And as we saw before, isotonic improved. And finally, let's look at the spline column. And then we'll make our predictions. And you see, this is how Spline Calib did on the new calibration set. So again, you see it, it, it fits the calibration data quite well. So it has enough degrees of freedom to really be able to fit the data quite well, even in the areas where there's not a lot of, of uh, examples for it to learn from. Um, And here's now how it looks on the test set. So again, seems to be fitting it pretty closely. Uh, again, I think there's some luck of the draw in terms of the previous calibration set really was below the x x uh, below the line y equals x before. Now it's uh, the previous the current one is a lot above, and the truth is kind of somewhere in the middle. So here's the reliability diagram post calibration. Say it looks pretty good. And again, on the logit scale, looks pretty good. Maybe a little off here. Again, I think some of that was the luck of the draw of the calibration set. And if we look at the losses, so we see a slightly different picture now. So isotonic improved, although somewhat surprisingly, it's still underperforming plat scaling. Beta is now doing better than plat scaling. And spline calib is still doing better than all of them, although spline calib actually did not improve getting more data. And again, I think a, a little of that was luck of the draw of, of the calibration sets. And now let's also look at the prior scores. So um, now isotonic is improving the prior score. Actually, beta calibration is doing worse, as, as is plat scaling. And spline calibration is doing, is doing better than isotonic. Okay, so now I, I want, again, I want you guys to, to spend some time playing around with this, uh, with this data. So first, again, take your RF model two and create a cross-validated set just like we did. 
and repeat this process with RF model two and compare your results to RF model one. And, you know, I think you're going to see, again, there's not always a very clear, consistent picture. There's a lot of variance in terms of the luck of the draw of the calibration sets you get and the test sets that you get and how the different fitting methods react to those. Um, so for extra credit, I, I, I want you to go take the original notebook, change the random state in cell five, and, and then do a restart and run all and, and run through this whole notebook with different random states and see how much things change just by changing different random states. And then adjust the training and calibration sizes and see how that affects the performances. Um, and, and I think that'll help give a, a, a sense of just how much variation there just naturally is. So some of the things you might notice is that, that isotonic regression can be quite variable, especially with the smaller calibration sets. Um, it generally tends to improve quite a bit as it gets more data. It's the most, it's the most kind of data hungry. Um, beta calibration does tend to beat plat scaling, even though that wasn't the case in, in the first example we showed here. Um, and the rankings for log loss are often not the same as for Breyer score. So I think these are all important take home lessons. So uh, let's stop here. And then in the last section, we're going to talk about some more advanced topics.